Hello, everyone, and welcome back to a brand new episode of the Master Your Mental podcast. Today, we are going to be getting into the topic of ADHD Be Gone with my special guest. Joining me to share his expertise and personal experience in this area with ADHD is Aaron Huey. Aaron is the founder of Fire Mountain Programs, a residential treatment center in Colorado, helping troubled teens overcome many challenges. Aaron also hosts the Beyond Risk and Back podcast and has 20 years experience working with parents of teens that struggle, teens in recovery from trauma, anxiety, depression, mental health struggles, self-harm, drugs, trafficking, and suicide attempts. I'm very excited to be diving into this conversation today. So without further ado, welcome Aaron to the podcast. Thank you. Boy, that guy sounds awesome. Hey, that's, (laughs) I, I can't wait to meet him. I know. I'm so excited to talk with you, you guys. Like just before we got on, I was like, I can just tell this is going to be such a good conversation. I was like, I love his energy already and I'm so ready for this. But that's what I want to ask you too, is before we go ahead and jump on in here, I would love if you could tell me what is one thing that lights you up like nothing else? Opportunities. Yes. I I, I just, (laughs) I have, my brothers call me lucky. I have two brothers. They call me lucky. And (laughs) luck to me is where opportunity meets preparation. And my whole life has just been about audacity. Who dares wins? Mm -hmm. And when I see something and somebody says, hey, do you want to? I'm like, yeah. God, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead and finish what you were going to say. What, what did you want me to do? No, like, I love, I, I, I love I am, that. I am just so ready to say yes to whatever that they don't, they don't have to finish their sentence. I'm a, I'm a yes. I'm a yes, man. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to try it. And I'll learn on the way. I'll do it while I'm, I'll learn it while I'm doing it. I will launch a rocket before it's built. That's amazing. I love how you talk about audacity and just like the drive to, you know, accomplish that and start those opportunities. So I'd love to kind of hear about the background because one thing I thought was super cool about what you're doing is starting fire mountain program. So I'd love to hear like, how did you get into that? Is that anything to do with your story and your experiences or how did you get into that? So I was, uh, abandoned by my biological father right out of the gate. Um, never met him, never reached out to me, never contacted me. I was diagnosed with ADHD uh, in fourth grade. And this was in the early 70s. So I was put on Ritalin um, and was a nice test subject for Ritalin. The bullying started pretty soon after that. Uh, when things got progressively worse and then uh, started learning martial arts in seventh grade. Uh, Martial arts has always been a cornerstone of my life since then, but uh, the problems really began after high school, which I barely made it out of. Thank you, Jerry Kokora, for giving me a D minus instead of an F. (laughs) Um, And uh, I went to acting school after high school and was sexually assaulted by my best friend who had the same name as my biological father. And there is my psyche laid bare wow. for you. Um, that led to whatever was experimentation with alcohol and drugs uh, that led to daily use. I you know, the, the the confusion, the betrayal, the sadness, the trauma, the the fear, everything that came with the sexual assault. Mm-hmm. Um, everything just started. Well, I mean, the bottom line is that when I was high, I was happy. And when I was sober, I was suicidal. Mm. And so I had a lot of people telling me I should stop smoking pot, uh, and drinking, and using LSD. But what I couldn't tell them was the moment I did, I was ready to bail. I was ready mm-hmm. to dip. Um, that habit, that maladaptive coping strategy continued to facilitate and fester until I was 28 years old, married. That marriage was coming to a crashing burn. I had a daughter, uh, was a terrible employee. I was a, a fun dad, but I was not a present dad. Uh, I was a terrible husband. Um, and my wife left me. I was, I was at the Texas Renaissance Festival. I was running a sword dueling booth. And my wife said, I'm out. And 
think she saved, I don't think, I know she saved my life. She saved her life. She saved our daughter's life. Um, and that, that began a year process of just plummeting towards rock bottom. I got sober May 21st, 1998. I went to my first meeting on May 22nd, 1998. I started keeping a day timer on that day and have kept one ever since. I've tracked 23 years of sobriety. Wow. I know what, Amazing. I know, yeah, I know what works. I know why I'm successful. I could show you. Mm-hmm. And it was after that uh, that I was working at a kid's camp and I became the assistant director. I started running my own children's programming, um, warrior camp, wizard camp, jester camp, bard camp. I opened a martial arts school. I uh, started running teen rights and passage programs. And those they were all very successful. A lot of really good results. The beginning of my sobriety business was up and down. The economy crashed in 2009. And at the same time, this mob says, can my kid just come live with you? And I had two kids. I had, I had a son and a daughter. My, my second wife brought a, brought a son into the mix. And my wife and I said, yeah. And she told her sister who told her friend. The friend called us and said, can my son come live with you? And we were like, yeah. A week later, we had six boys living in our house and four on a wait list. And we started wow. running a sober home. In 2011, um, we started working with insurance. In 2013, we moved to 40 acres, a, a 30,000 square foot, per, you know, buildings and outhouses and not outhouses, uh, <laughs> employee houses, yeah. outbuildings that were employee houses. Um, bought the place in 2015. In 2019, we were named top 50 healthcare provider in the United States. Wow. In 2020, Congrats. We got, Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> in 2020, we got top 100 innovator of healthcare. And then in 2021, my property insurance policy for fire insurance because of the fires here in Estes Park went from $20,000 a year $470,000 a year. And I closed down my teen treatment facility 34 days ago. Wow. Oh my. Okay. Yeah. I just, I just love hearing like the progression in your story of like hearing you talk about where you were at one point and like all these low moments and going through all of this and struggling with alcohol, drugs, and just feeling so down and, and doing that to escape feeling those suicidal thoughts and having those experiences and doing it to escape from it and then coming out and creating something to help people who've been in the same situation, similar situations, and being able to put something together that people can access and tap into and really get what you needed at those times, because that's what really makes me so happy is just to hear that. So I'd love to ask you too, like in it, in your journey so far, like what, did you have like a pivotal moment that where you were and you remember it and you remember this moment when you were like, I'm, I need to make a change or what was it for you that made, that made you go from those places that you were to where you are now? You know, the, the rock bottom process, people like to talk about an incident or a moment, but I think often for a lot of addicts, it happens over a period of time where you just know it's coming and you don't, Nobody wants, no child I have ever worked with have, has ever planned on being here. Mm-hmm. Like, like now nobody had a global pandemic in their five-year business plan. Like this is, there mm-hmm. are things that happen to us, right? I was sexually assaulted. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you have a computer, it can get hacked. You have a village, a dragon can attack it. But there's the, this, the progression towards rock bottom to the moment where you say, it's over. One thing about being an addict is that you've wanted it to be over for a long time. The misery, the pain, the drugs aren't even fun anymore. It's not even a, a thing that, that provides that relief. You're suicidal when you're sober and you're suicidal when you're high and you're just miserable. I was 28 years old. I was either living in my truck or in my parents' house. And I just remember hitting my knees on the 20th of May, 1998, I hit my knees. I was upstairs in what used to be my brother's room, my youngest brother's room. And I just, I said, I'm not going to stop. You have to stop me. I'm not going to quit. You have to make me quit. I am not stronger than this. I've tried and I failed. I've tried again and I can't figure this out. So God, goddess, 
anybody, you got to make me quit. And I went to bed. I, 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 that was it. And I just humbly asked for a miracle. I just said, I'm not going to stop. You got to stop me. And the next day they did. And it was three distinct experiences of unconditional love. The first was from a divine source, an overwhelming feeling and a sense of presence in my life where I knew I could put the drugs down and never pick them up. I called the Triangle Club, the 12 step room later that day, and a guy answered the phone. It was Triangle Club. I go, when's your next NA meeting? I think I'm an addict. And he goes, where are you, dude? I'll come get you. And I go, don't do this. And he goes, it's okay, man. I go, don't fucking say it. And he goes, dude, I love you. It's okay. I'll come get you. And I said, I can't do this right now. And he goes, I'll, uh, he says, we have a meeting every hour on the hour. If you need a ride, someone will come get you. And he hung up and I hung up. And I, and I just had to sit with that idea of what it was like to be loved for someone to, who's ready to drop everything in a second for a stranger and come get me. Mm -hmm. And I went to bed. It was like one in the afternoon. I just went to bed. I got up the next day. I found a meeting I was going to go to. And I went downstairs and my parents were watching. They were sitting in front of, of this red couch with this green carpet, watching Clean and Sober with Michael Keaton on TV. <laughs> and, I, and I come downstairs and I sit in between them and I'm watching this movie. And I remember the first time I'd seen this movie, I was high. And I turn off the TV and my mom, she has this little funny voice. She goes, she goes, excuse me. And it's just, she was being, you know, jokey. And I mm -hmm. looked at her and I knew I was just about to crush her. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm not going to a work meeting today. I'm going to an NA meeting. I think I'm an addict. And my mom goes pale. And my dad, who's not the man it's not my father, but he's the man who raised me. He's the man who adopted me. He's the man who took me in as his own. And he said, whatever you need me to do, I'll do it because I love you. Mm -hmm. And I was in 24 hours to have, you know, divinity, a stranger, and the man who had raised me mm -hmm. to just say, I love you. I was like, oh, God, what I've been searching for my whole life has been searching for me. And it's right here. So I went to the meeting, went to my first meeting, and it was a speaker's meeting. And at 23 years later, I, I still talk about this day, and it hits me like it happened yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I and they announced at the beginning of the meeting that it's a speaker's meeting. So naturally, I assumed they meant me. I was the one to talk because I am so damn important. And I love the sound <laughs> of my voice. So there I was waiting and they said, okay, our speaker today is, and I got up to talk and a hand grabbed my shirt and yanked me down into a chair. And I turned around to swing on this dude. And he was this gigantic former Hells Angels, Pagans, Nomads, Viker dude. And he's just sitting in his chair and he's big old gray beard resting on his chest and his big old belly hanging out there and he looks at me and he doesn't flinch and I'm cocked and I'm ready to go and I'm over him and he doesn't flinch and he goes sit the down and shut the fuck up for once in your life and maybe you'll learn something and I sat down and the actual speaker got up and said when I was 12 years old I started smoking pot I didn't have a father and this guy told my story wow and afterwards, I turned around to the biker dude who pulled me down in my chair and I go, would you be my sponsor? And he goes, of course, I'm going to be your sponsor. And, <laughs> and on the way home that night, I got pulled over by a cop. And he comes to the window and he goes, do you have drugs in your car? And I looked at him and I'm like, for the first time in seven years, no. I just went to my first NA meeting. I'm an addict. And he shines his flashlight around the car and I got a stack of narcotics anonymous books in the passenger seat of my truck because i just spent every dime i had on every book i was going to do this thing and do it right and he looks at me and he goes keep going back it works if you work it you're worth it wow. which is what we say at the end of every meeting to each other so this cop was an na guy mm. and i was like this is and that was it 
that was the beginning of the end. They started keeping a day timer and I've tracked my life for 23 years to that's so oh, that's I that's love it. I love it. I love how I love all those moments that you mentioned that like these little things that popped up, like when you called and he said, I'll, I'll drop everything. I'll come to you. I love you. And the same thing with your, with your dad and the response you got from the police officer. And then just all of these little things that kept happening and kept coming up. And I just think that's so amazing. And just hearing you talk about it and like seeing, like hearing you get emotional about it and like, just like it just happened yesterday. Like you're talking about this, like it just happened and going back and being able to, and that just shows how powerful it is that you, that, that this has had the impact it's had on your life, that it's still to this day, when you bring up the story and get into this and talk about this transition, that it still brings tears to your eyes to really show that this is truly what it's done for you. And it's not just, you know, I did this and it worked and great, you know, next thing, we're going to move on to the next thing, but this is something that has completely just transformed your life. And I can, I can hear it in your voice. I can hear it in like the story, just all of it and just see it and, and know that you've impacted so many people through this work. And I'd love to kind of tie in, you know, like what the role of ADHD has in all this. So we're, cause I want to hear that too. So like, were you ever diagnosed with ADHD or like, how, yeah. how did that happen? Or like, what role does that play in everything? My mom, my mom tells the story of when I was born, like she could pass me around the room. Uh, part of the La Leche League class and Lamaz classes and all that type of stuff. She'd pass me around the room and I'd perform differently depending on whose lap I was in. Oh, she yeah. always noticed that I could intuit what mm-hmm. that person needed from me. Um, when, I, uh, when I was in kindergarten, a doctor came in to talk about ADHD and my mom says that all the other mothers were looking at her like, yo, he's talking about your kid. And the <laughs> teachers are like, oh, Leanna, he's talking about Aaron. And she, you know, she burst into tears because she felt like that was the first time that a doctor mm-hmm. had said, no, no, this is a thing. It's not just this, your kid is, this is actually a thing he's got. My mom's progressive side, um, as we got older and we're looking into it, and when I was in fourth grade where she had me tested for it, Uh, my mom and my dad was that she was she was never one for just saying let's put them on pills Mm -hmm. my mom is always a pills and skills woman Mm -hmm. you know it's like what else let's get him into hockey because he could play the goalie and see everything that's going on i want to explain adhd for people who may not understand it and i can tell you what it's like inside my head 24 7 heavy metal flamenco dancing screen therapy Mm -hmm. that's what's going on up here all Mm -hmm. the time um people say well people with adhd they can't pay attention that's not true i pay attention to everything equally so while i'm talking to you i'm also noticing the sun glinting off the ground outside and this colorful lamp and the charging cord here and realizing that i've only got so much battery power and on and on and that my brain does not prioritize anything it senses Mm. So with that comes some curses because Mm -hmm. people want me to focus on them or focus on what they're talking about or focus on, and that's just not, I'm not built that way. This is not about willingness. This is about capability. Some things you want from me, I'm not capable of providing. And that's hard on my relationships. So much so that I always had to be hypersensitive to how I was affecting other people. Mm -hmm. That made me very uh, sensitive to criticism. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, yeah. the idea of c- criticism, sensitivity, dysphoria is one of the number one things that people, that adults with ADHD deal with. Here's another way of saying it. I get butt hurt really easily. Yeah. But that's because <laughs> I have spent my life making sure I fit in because rejection was a constant. Mm. ADHD what it's given me as a gift is um, I can watch someone talk and while they're talking, I can listen to their words. I can watch their body language and I can see their micro expressions. So I have a truth detector. I have a lie detector built in so much so that I can teach therapists micro expressions. Um, I'm, I'm compulsive and I'm impulsive. 
So I will get stuck in habits and those habits will either be maladaptive or they will be progressive. I work very hard to make sure that I am up early, have my coffee, get to the gym, do my day timer because I do it every day, cook my meals and be a good father, be a good husband, be a good businessman, help people do my 12th step, take the message of hope. Because if I don't create my day, my day gets created for me. Oh, and I am yeah. running around mm-hmm. chasing bright lights <laughs> and shiny objects all day. A hundred percent. Wow. I, I feel like I just relate so much to everything that you just brought up right there, especially with, you know, with get with the diagnosis of ADHD and everything. And I'd love to ask you, you know, in terms of the work that you've done so far with teens and mental health, like what is the most valuable lesson that you have learned so far? The difference between capability and willingness Mm. to understand that I would really like to be capable to be the type of person who could buckle down and focus and do the things that I don't want to do, like focus on numbers so I can get taxes and receipts done. If I, I I can focus when I have a rock tumbler, Mm -hmm. heavy metal music and Bob Proctor, T. Harvecker or Tony Robbins all three of those going at the same time, then I can read because Mm -hmm. I have to be able to occupy all the other parts of my brain that are working just as hard as that one part that you want me to use with you. Now, what I was able to translate that to with the teenagers and the families that I work with is that a lot of times we give consequences to people who are not capable of avoiding those consequences. Mm. And so my job has largely been to go in with families as a family interventionist, a parent interventionist, and a child interventionist, and supervise the scenario, and then be able to say to the parents, no, no, this depression is environment. We need to change the environment. The depression will subside, right? No, no, no. It's it's been raining for 15 days straight. That's their depression. No, they don't have any friends and they're lonely. They're depressed because of that. Or to go, no, no, this is clinical depression. Their depression is affecting everything else. They're not being affected by everything creating depression. Stop looking for, you know, why are you depressed? Do we need to go? Dude, they're depressed because they have a malfunctioning brain chemistry. See, to that note, depression is not a feeling. It's a description of brain chemistry. Anxiety is not a feeling. Anxiety is an alarm that the amygdala has set off. And educating parents on the difference between, it's not that they're not willing to go to school. It's that their anxiety is telling them to not move because they think they're going to get hurt because something in the picture that they have of the future reminds them of a trauma. So Mm -hmm. now we've got to revisit the trauma and try to do trauma exposure until we can figure out which part of the picture is triggering the amygdala. Who would do that on purpose? Who would choose that? Mm -hmm. That's about willingness. You know, if a kid's being a butthead and you give them a consequence (laughs) and they, and they switch things up and fly straight, that's willingness. I love that. I love how you break down the differences between, like you said, willingness and capability, because I think that's so important, especially when you're working with teens and their parents and and you're talking about ADHD, right. And trying to help them understand that too, because sometimes I feel like something that I see is, you know, the, the parents feel helpless, right? Like they've tried, they've done all these things. They've done this, they tried this, they, you know, are trying to help, but they feel like, Oh, like nothing's working. I don't know what to do. And then they come to you and they get you and they start to actually understand like these differences you're talking about. So like the differences between being willing to do something and willing to make, to make this work and make these changes and then having the capabilities to do that. And what does that look like? And what does that mean? And I love how you break that down because I know that that probably helps tremendously with the relationship just between the teens and their parents with having that and struggling with ADHD and feeling very out of control. And like you said, having that focus of where you're focusing on this, but then also all these other things at once. And then, you know, looking at the, the good things of it, right. Instead of, Oh, like all the bad stuff. Cause we can spend so long talking about 
right? The problems and the consequences and all the things that have happened to you because of this. But when you start to shift it and look towards solutions, right? And what can we do with the situation, right? I love it's a, that. It's, it's amazing because I think what the most provocative and important thing at the same time that you bring up is the idea that the solutions are not something that's outside of the issues that you're dealing with directly. Like the first thing we say is, well, when my kid does this, you know, I have to counter that behavior with a consequence or with a, you know, with something so that they know that doing that, that that strategy is a bad strategy. When what, what I was allowed to do as a kid, what my, what I really believe my mom and dad did really well was they looked at this audacious, hyper energetic little kid and they put him on stage they put him they put him in a goal in goalie pads they they tried to find the places where what i had worked mm. right what i had doesn't work in a math class what i had works in front of a hockey net what I had did not work when I had to sit down and listen to the history of our country as an older man I'm fascinated by it but as a kid like it was <laughs> awful especially if the teacher sucked at presenting the material but what I had was there was a story I told on a podcast the other day when I was an officer at I was I was a security officer in Denver at St. Joseph's Hospital which is no longer there but it had been there for years and years and it was right on the edge of five points it was a pretty uh, uh, dangerous part of town um, we were just right out there on one of the corners and we were in a shift change and I was one of the supervising security officers and we were a lot of armed officers and we suddenly got a call shots fired on the front ramp and because we were in a shift change there were a lot of officers there with us so we all went running out this side door i looked up at the ramp where officer Ludi was covering a pregnant woman with his body and there are just gunshots going off everywhere and i i'm screaming Ludi, where's the shooter where's the shooter and he goes 18th and franklin third floor and i look up and a barrel spins over and goes bang, 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 bang. Wow. and my world went <laughs> and i saw everything and the environment started moving at the same speed my brain does. Wow. And suddenly everything that was going on in my head, I'm looking at my officers and I'm yelling at them to put their guns away because we can't shoot into a window of a third story building. And I now have to write them all up. I notice a man across the street who's hiding behind a, an electrical box and his legs look like they're injured. I notice Officer Ludi and how he's starting to move the woman off the ramp. The shots stop and a car comes pulling out of an alley going the wrong way up 18th. I get the license plate, the color, everything was moving at my speed. And so it wasn't that my brain was broken or that it was wrong. It was just in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. And when, when I'm in an environment with 18th, kids who have all been suicidal and depressed mm -hmm. and drug addicts and anxious and in crisis and their families in crisis and we're running a school and I'm teaching hero's journey and the kids are I can do that with them I can go where they go and it's not I'm not handicapped you just need to know where to put me so to parents of kids with ADHD it's not the content mm -hmm. it's the context you put that context of that child in the right place and they will thrive. You make them an ER nurse. You, you, you get them into, into uh, uh, you know, the, the learn how to do first aid and CPR. Teach them outdoor survival and emergency medicine and martial arts. Put them into something that moves at their speed and watch. You will realize that this is brilliant. It's wisdom. It's, it's athleticism. <laughs> it's fluid. It's everything you want your kid to have. You just got them in the wrong place. I love that. I love, how, I love how you frame that. And then just like the whole description of doing that to really benefit your kid instead of putting it like having them constantly feel so bogged down and like something's wrong with them. I love how you switch that and just completely like change that narrative to make it positive and empowering for people. And one thing I, I would love to ask you, this is like, I love asking everybody this question because I always get all kinds of different answers and it's always fun to see what people say. So 
Aaron, what are you currently doing right now in this moment to master your mental? Um, my flow state is activated through these types of conversations, <laughs> through teaching and talking and storytelling. The, the expression of Aaron, once I was able to truly embrace who I was and who I am, my concept of me is that I'm God's caffeine buzz. <laughs> and that, that being that, doing that, having no shame in that, it's really easy as a 52-year-old who if somebody doesn't like it, you'd be like, eh, like I care whether you like it. Like I care whether it fits in your perfect little world. My perfect, amazing, expansive, audacious world needs me. So you, meh, get away. Like, <laughs> but, but these flow state moments are how we do master the mental. You know, when people say, I do my best work, my, my back's against the wall. Yeah, yeah duh, everybody does. <laughs> yeah. like, and so why not live with your back against the wall? Mm -hmm. Why not put yourself, why is not your work that thing that allows you to light up your world? Yes. The, the word <laughs> fire mountain which was the, originally the name of our, my martial arts school, becomes the name of, of our company, the name of all our kids camps. It's from the I Ching and it's, it's number 22, grace. The fire within the mountain that is unleashed and illuminates heaven. Mm. And that's what the work has always been with kids. That's been the 12th step is I want to be that, that divine form, that dad form, that sponsor form, that stranger form who is willing to show up and be in this moment with you because that's my flow state, because I'm on, I'm either on or I'm off and doing podcasts, being a podcast host, working with teens, working with their parents when their parents are like, okay, my teen stole the car, totaled it. They had a alcohol level so high that they went to the ICU and now they're in acute care. They threatened suicide yesterday and insurance wants to send them home and doesn't want to pay. What do I do? I'm like, yeah, I got you. I'm here. Let's stick. Let's be the light in the shadow. Let's erupt now here together. That's what I'm doing right now is embracing my flow state. That is amazing. That is so cool. I love it. I love it so much because that's something I actually have not heard before. I haven't heard someone say embracing their flow state, but I think the way that you just broke that down and how you, how you became this person to be this person for kids out there, the teens that you're working with, everyone that you're serving who needs that. And you are that person. You went from being this person who had so many things that were thrown your way and and all these obstacles that you were presented with, but be turning that around and making that into something that you can take and say here, like I'm here, I'm there. I'm going to do it. We're going to do it together to make it work for other people, I think is amazing. And I can't even put it into words because it's so cool. And so are you. I, oh my gosh, I just love talking to you. I love the stories you told. I love just being able to hear a little bit about your story and your journey and just these turning points for you and these moments of progression and continuing to move forward and, you know, take those opportunities, like you said in the beginning. And I just think that's so awesome. And Aaron, I just, I want to thank you for coming out and coming on to master your mental and sharing this wisdom with us, sharing these tips with us and all of the things that you shared today. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate being on your show and yes. hollering at your crowd first. Of course. And you guys, whether you're listening to this during the daytime or the nighttime, I hope that you guys have an awesome rest of your day or night. And I'm going to say bye to you guys and bye to Aaron. So bye, Aaron. Bye.